Leviticus chapter 25 from verses 44 to 46 is probably the most quoted verse in the Bible that is used to discuss slavery. The verse reads, As for your male and female slaves, whom you may have, you may acquire male and female slaves from the pagan nations that are around you. You may also acquire them from the sons of the foreign residents who reside among you, and from their families who are with you, whom they will have produced in your land. They also may become your possession. You may also pass them on as an inheritance to your sons after you, to receive as a possession. You can use them as permanent slaves. But in respect to your countrymen, the sons of Israel, you shall not rule with severity over another. This verse raises an interesting question. I mean, some might come up to another and try to provide this verse as evidence for the Bible being immoral, or at least God being immoral. I mean, how can you survey God who allows for his people to own slaves from other nations permanently? even to the point of passing them down to the sons of the master. Firstly, we must acknowledge the historical reality. The text clearly states that the Israelites had slaves, whether from other nations or their own people. And I address a lot of these slavery tendencies in the Biblical Slavery, the Exodus 21 Perspective series, but those seem to focus a lot on the Israelites rather than all slaves from different nations. Leviticus chapter 25 from verses 44 to 46 seems to introduce a formal law or command in dealing with the foreign slaves. Now the simplest answer is to acknowledge it happened. It's a simple response, but really there are two questions that need to be addressed. Is this immoral and why would God allow this? Now first, am I saying slavery is immoral or moral? As I explained in the previous series, there is more to slavery in the ancient world and there are a lot of factors that need to be involved in to determine if an action is immoral or not. It's easy to say things like slavery or even things like murder or stealing are objectively immoral actions, but why though? I mean really think about the reasons for why one calls an action moral or not. And is that action something that mankind should consider objectively immoral or not? From my experience, those who tell me the blanket statement, slavery is immoral and don't believe there is a God, usually follow what is known as moral relativism or moral anti-realism. Now, moral relativism is the belief that what's right or wrong can vary between individuals or societies. There's no absolute moral truth. On the other hand, moral anti-realism is the belief that there are no objective moral truths or facts. What's right or wrong depends on an individual or societal beliefs, simply. Those I speak to don't believe there's any objective moral standard that's independent of what humans decide. But with that thought process, they seem to not provide any rational answer to why slavery should be seen as objectively immoral action in mankind. I mean, if I think slavery is moral, and you think it's not, who's right? Now there's way more to this and that will lead to a whole different discussion of morality. But the main takeaway that you say slavery is objectively immoral, is it objectively immoral independent of what mankind says, or based on you and your peers' opinions? Now if God is supposed to be a good and loving God, why allow this? What is his purpose? First of all, I'm not God, so I don't really know what 100% he will say here, but I do have thoughts on what might be the purpose for commanding this. I believe it's best to read the Septuagint, as I believe it provides a clearer picture on what is happening in the verses. In the Septuagint, there's a clear difference between a foreigner slash sojourner and a proselyte. Now, in many added versions of the Bible, such as the NSAB or the KJV, the English word stranger is sometimes translated as either sojourner, proselyte, or neither. Now, in my opinion, this may create confusion when looking at these words, usages, and meanings. In the Septuagint, there seems to be a clear distinction between a foreigner and a proselyte. Let's look at Exodus chapter 12. When talking about who may participate in Passover, verse 45 states, A sojourner or hireling shall not eat of it. While verse 48 states, And if any proselyte shall come to you to keep the Passover to the Lord, you shall circumcise every male of him. Then shall he approach to sacrifice it, and he shall be even as the original inhabitant of the land. No uncircumcised person shall eat of it. A sojourner may not participate in Passover, while a proselyte may be able to. This isn't a one-time occurrence either. A foreigner is usually compared with higher help, or not seen as holy as you can give them meat that Israelites shall not consume. But what is the difference between a foreigner slash sojourner and a proselyte? It seems that the foreigners are just what the word says. They are strangers or foreign residents. Those who are not a part of the covenant of Israel. I mean, if I went to Mexico on vacation, I would be considered a foreigner there. But what is a proselyte? It seems that this individual was not someone who was a native born Israelite, but rather a foreigner who decided to join the covenant of Israel. Look at verses like Leviticus chapter 18 verse 26, Leviticus chapter 24 verse 22, and Numbers chapter 15 verses 15 to 16. This individual was under the same laws as the native born Israelite. Now note the label proselyte is there to represent the people. There could be another term, but this label is easy to differentiate them. But what does this have to do with Leviticus chapter 25 and verses 44 to 46? Let's read again the Septuagint. And whatever number of men servants and maid servants you shall have, you shall purchase male and female servants from the nations that are around about you, and of the sons of the sojourners that are among you, and of these you shall buy of their relations. 
all that shall be in your lands. Let them be to you for a possession, and you shall distribute them to your children after you. They shall be to you permanent possessions forever. But your brethren, the children of Israel, one shall not oppress his brother in labors. This passage states that those individuals acquired as a possession were from foreign nations. It seems to state that they may be in your possessions forever. But what if they convert? What if they want to join the covenant? It seems, in my opinion, that those individuals will be granted the same rights as the native born, i.e. the seven year release. I mean, let's look at Exodus chapter 12, verse 48 again, as it states for one who wants to keep the Passover to the Lord. He shall be even as the original inhabitant of the land. These individuals were considered equal to the natives. And it's not like you have to be a native born Israelite to be received or considered one of the Lord's people or righteous. Just look at individuals like Melchizedek, Rahab the Canaanite, Ruth the Moabite, and Job the Edomite. If a foreign slave wants to be converted, they may be a part of the Lord's people. But why would the Lord allow that? Well, think about it. If the nations were considered righteous and want to acquire a slave from those nations, does Israel just release them into their nation? No. The slave can only be released after they consider to join the nation and follow under the covenant. Now those foreigners could bring their own influences to change the nation. Just look at instances like Ezra chapter 10 and 1 Kings chapter 11. It was dangerous to have intermingling between the people with different beliefs. This was a way so if a foreigner would have to be willing to follow the Lord and be his slave if they want to join the covenant. The Israelites or other masters were supposed to observe the Lord's law correctly. Have the slaves observe what it means to follow the Lord. Have them observe the actions of the Israelites and be influenced by them to join them. Also note, there is a possibility that the slave could want to stay permanently if they wanted to. Let's look at Abraham's slave Eliezer. Overall, the Vicar chapter 25 verses 44 to 46 must be read in context on who those individuals are. Now, is it possible that my biases may affect my conclusion on what is happening? Duh, just like everyone else. But it does make sense in the context of having foreign slaves for Israelites with the Lord as described in the Bible. 